Thanks very much, Bruce, and, and thanks all for being here and for welcoming me so warmly to Seattle. This is my first visit to this extraordinarily beautiful but actually quite scary place. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk a bit just because I think it's so fundamental to considering nuclear weapons to talk a bit about the consequences of the current science to make sure we're all on the same page address very briefly the, the growing danger of their use, but then spend most of the time talking about the really quite remarkable pro process of the humanitarian initiative that led to this historic treaty adopted last year, and, and particularly on what it means and how we can use it towards uh, progressing abolition of these things that really don't deserve to be called weapons. I'm often reminded by the extraordinary foresight and wisdom of Albert Einstein, particularly for me expressed in these two sayings. In a university context, I think it's particularly apt to pay reference to the responsibility to act that comes with the privilege of, of knowledge and just how much our thinking needs to change uh, with nuclear weapons in a way that our institutions have, have yet to deal with. Most policy around nuclear weapons is not evidence-based. The current arsenals, if you dropped a Hiroshima-sized bomb every two hours since the end of 1945, you would not have finished yet to reach the current global arsenal, even though, happily, 50,000 nuclear weapons have been dismantled. There's an extraordinary level of destruction embodied in those weapons. Mm -hmm. Particularly in Washington State, the home of Hanford, I think some reference to the things that put the nuclear in nuclear weapons is, is needed. Um, there are vast quantities of fissile materials globally, 1,340 tonnes of highly enriched uranium, 520 tonnes of separated plutonium and growing you need a handful of kilograms of, of plutonium or about three times as much HEU for a weapon. There's enough plutonium and highly enriched uranium in the civilian and military stockpiles to reconstitute the global nuclear arsenal more than 10 times over. Dealing with these, ending their production, keeping those that remain as secure as possible, eliminating them where possible, is going to be essential to achieving and sustaining a world free of nuclear weapons. And it highlights for me particularly how the cat's out of the bag here. We can't restrict access to these weapons and control them by controlling access to the fissile materials that make the weapons. We need a rules-based order that applies the same standard to all countries. Any determined state can acquire these materials. The World Health Organization went and examined the effects of nuclear war on health and health services in some landmark reports in the 1980s, concluded that they constitute the greatest immediate threat to human health and welfare. I found that actually profoundly um, providing a really a, a benchmark for professional and ethical behavior as a health professional when the first report was released in 1983, that, that really was affected me very considerably. WHO made it clear that no health service in any country or in combination could deal with effectively with the aftermath of even a single nuclear detonation on an urban centre and, and in medical terms pointed out that really the only feasible approach was primary prevention. The most important new science that should send waves of policy ramifications to every dark recess of the nuclear uh, enterprise is the evidence around the climate impacts of even a relatively small scale regional nuclear war. Most people when they think about climate change think appropriately of, of global warming. Most people don't realise that the greatest risk of acute climate disruption is from nuclear weapons. It's estimated that the relatively small tactical size weapon by today's standards that destroyed Hiroshima released about as much energy in the fires that it ignited as in the explosive power of the weapon. 
So nuclear weapons are extraordinarily efficient at igniting simultaneous fires over a large area that will coalesce uh, into confluent fires that put vast quantities of smoke into the upper atmosphere. The largest warheads still deployed are five megatons, five million tons of high explosive equivalent uh, on Chinese long range land based missiles. If you placed one of those over this fair city, um, it would ignite an area of 1,600 square kilometres, 23 kilometres in, in each direction. Um, it would essentially obliterate the whole of, the, of Seattle and, and its surrounding um, areas. The scenario that most, that a number of climate science groups have studied um, is what would happen if India and Pakistan used 100 sized Hiroshima bombs? That's actually just over a third of the nuclear weapons that they possess. It's not an unrealistic scenario. They've been to war three times since independence, mobilized half a million troops on the border in the Kargil emergency in 1999. So it's, and both states have policies for early use of nuclear weapons if it came to a war with invasion. This is less than a half of a percent of the global nuclear arsenal in terms of numbers. And because the average sized weapon in the arsenal is not 15 kilotons, but 200 kilotons, it's less than a tenth of a percent of the explosive yield of that arsenal. It would, of course, have calamitous immediate consequences. But it's really the climate impacts of about 6 million tons of smoke injected that I want to just quickly review for you. This is from Alan Robach's studies, which would show that within a matter of about 10 days or so, the smoke from such a war in South Asia would cover most of the inhabited regions of the planet. This is from Mike Mills at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Um, a more sophisticated and recent model. This is as if you took a cross section through the atmosphere with the South Pole here, the equator in the middle, the North Pole here. The troposphere where our weather happens, there's clouds and rain and snow and particulate matter can get washed out, is here, less than 20 kilometers in height. Have a look what happens to the smoke that would be injected from burning cities ignited by nuclear weapons. Essentially, the smoke is very rapidly, within a matter of days in the stratosphere, spreads polewood in both directions, and actually much of it goes well into the mesosphere, where it, this hot, this smoke would heat, he'd be heated by sunlight so that the stratosphere and above would be around 50 to 80 degrees hotter than normal, while it would be colder, darker, and drier underneath. These impacts are not beneficial for agriculture. The modeling that's available to date, and there are some additional major studies underway that will produce results over the next couple of years to extend these findings. The current modeling looks at just colder, darker, drier. What does that do to major grain crops in the US and China, the two largest global producers? It doesn't address yet um, the other impacts on agriculture of loss of land to toxic chemical and radioactive contamination, um, the major increase in ultraviolet radiation from the drastic ozone depletion as a result of all that hot smoke in the stratosphere, and perhaps most importantly, the loss of all of the distribution and, and inputs that modern agriculture and trade in its products depends on, fuel, seed, fertilizer, etc. As you may have heard from Ira Helfand, who really pioneered this work, um, such a small localized regional nuclear war would put billions of people at risk of starvation in proportion to their current food insecurity um, on the other side of the planet. To highlight just how existential is this threat and just how remote from reality are the current arsenals. Consider the warheads on one of the submarines that are housed not too far from here. Those warheads, which each of which is between six and 30 times the size of the Hiroshima bomb, if targeted on the most fuel dense cities in the world, those in China, would produce not 
five or six million tonnes of smoke, the scenario I've shown you, but 23 million tonnes of smoke. Each of these is a climate catastrophe uh, in waiting. Let's put a perspective on this. This is the warming trend that is producing so much justified concern, which would be more than rapid and very rapidly offset by a average cooling by about a degree and a half um, by the scenario that I've shown you. If just the long-range weapons that the US and Russia have on high alert were targeted on cities, it would produce about five degrees average cooling, which is essentially average ice age conditions. If all of the long-range weapons that Russia and the United States have now that New START is fully implemented as of earlier this year, it would produce cooling about twice that, about 10 degrees colder. It's very hard to imagine humanity surviving abrupt global cooling of that, of that magnitude. Um, even at, at this scale, agriculture at higher latitudes, um, such as around the northern US and, and certainly Canada and northern Europe, would, would essentially cease. So many of those involved in these studies have, have drawn the conclusion that the theory of mutually assured destruction that underpins supposed deterrence theory amongst rational leaders um, is really not the reality. The reality is that any risk, any use of nuclear weapons um, involves essentially gl global suicide risk. These are really global suicide bombs is the most appropriate um, conceptual analogy. Could this happen? Well. Unfortunately, things are not generally heading in a very positive direction with one important exception we'll come to later. None of the nuclear armed states are disarming. There is obviously promising discussions in relation to the Korean Peninsula that is extraordinarily welcome compared with the, the ratcheting, belligerent rhetoric that we heard just to, uh, less than a year ago. Um, but this has yet to be bedded down in any firm agreements that we can be confident will survive the vagaries of the individuals involved. We're seeing even the limited constraints that we've hard won at the end of the Cold War that constrain um, particularly the two largest arsenals, Russia and the US, between them 92% of the world's nuclear weapons, um, being eroded. And worse than not, fulfilling their legal obligation to disarm, all of the nuclear armed states are massively investing in not just retaining, but what modernizing these weapons, essentially planning new, more sophisticated and flexible, low yield, more accurate weapons um, that are really involve vast sums of money, $1.2 billion just in the Obama administration um, envisaged expenditures over the next 30 years, even if you don't consider in the, uh, the increases planned under the current administration. So not going so well. George Schultz and Mikhail Gorbachev in the New York Times last week really highlighted very sharply how hazardous and negative is the putting the INF Treaty at risk, which was really the signature treaty that started the end of the Cold War and, and the, the reductions um, in nuclear arsenals between Russia and the US that happened at that time. Of course, accidents of various combinations of human and technical error have brought us to the brink many times. These are not going to end any time soon in complex, widely dispersed systems. Um, as Daniel Ellsberg's eloquently documented in his remarkable book, The Doomsday Machine, all of the nuclear armed states have considered first use of nuclear weapons on repeated occasions. He doc documents 25 instances when the US um, actively let it be known that nuclear use was, was on the table. And we've seen a, an escalation of very explicit nuclear threat um, over the last couple of years, not just in relation to the Korean Peninsula, but in, in the Middle East, between India and Pakistan, and between NATO and Russia, that, that we really haven't seen since the worst days of the, the Cold War. So most of those who've been around managing nuclear weapons in the past um, really conclude that, that the current danger of nuclear weapons being used is probably as great as it's ever been. Um, 
Mikhail Gorbachev continuing to, to be very clear and outspoken on this. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, the 15 Nobel laureates on its board of sponsors, the custodians of the Doomsday Clock, this year, you'll, be, you'll probably know, moved their hands forward to two minutes to midnight. The only other time they've been that far forward was in 1953, shortly after the US, sent, rapidly followed by Russia, um, tested thermonuclear weapons. Antonio Guterres, UN Secretary General, in a major report on di his disarmament plans for his tenure, used some pretty blunt language about um, how dangerous are the times that we live in and essentially what looks like a resumed Cold War. The two longer term trends that worry me the most are a rapid increase in the last decade in the number of armed conflicts globally that involve a state outside the area of conflict. Many of those are nuclear armed states. Each of these involves a risk of, of nuclear escalation by inadvertence or if not deliberate. Um, this is, I think, pr principally driven by the reality of climate disruption, food and water insecurity, population displacements really starting to bite. A climate stressed world is not a safer place to have nuclear weapons. And the other trend is this ungovernable morass of cyber technology used for malevolent purposes available to non-state actors as well as states, with now multiple precedents for private entities, public entities, banks, um, as well as nuclear systems being the subjects of attack. Even the computers of the US National Security Agency were extensively hacked late last year. So disarmament, I think it's useful to remind ourselves of just how deep and consistent is the will of the international community since in every expression since the end of the, the Second World War to eliminate these, these heinous weapons. The very first resolution of, of the UN General Assembly in, in January 1946 called on the elimination um, of atomic weapons. The NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which all countries bar North Korea, India, Pakistan and Israel have signed, um, enshrines a legally binding commitment on all states, not just the nuclear armed, actually, to negotiate in good faith towards disarmament. The International Court of Justice, the world's highest legal authority, has unanimously concluded that that obligation is not just to negotiate in good faith, but to actually bring these negotiations to a conclusion, that is, to finish the job. We have made really substantial progress on controlling the other major classes of inhumane and indiscriminate weapons, biological and chemical weapons, landmines and cluster munitions. In each case, despite varying histories, there are some common threads. In each case, incontrovertible evidence that these weapons can only have indiscriminate consequences has been the basis for enshrining their rejection in an international treaty that provides the same consistent standard for all states and then has provided the basis and motivation for the progressive elimination of the weapons. Stigmatize, prohibit, eliminate. It's been a, there's a really cogent lesson that, that really was much of the basis for, for ICANN's work in that history. Everything that you can say that's horrible and indiscriminate and unacceptable about a landmine or a cluster munition is of course writ large in the case of a nuclear weapon. The humanitarian initiative that, that led us to the Prohibition Treaty, let me just pick some of the elements because there are, there are some, I think, important lessons for us that I hope we can, we can draw out some more in the discussion. ICANN was very much inspired by the international campaign to ban landmines, that remarkable initiative that achieved a prohibition treaty on landmines despite the opposition of the major users and producers. Russia, China, US opposed that treaty, still haven't signed it, yet it was concluded and it has, has done a power of good. So a focused campaign coalition with a very clear goal, a treaty-based process to ban and eliminate nuclear weapons, 
based not on the politics or the security arguments, but their unacceptable, inhumane consequences, however they might be used. Helpful also was the rhetoric, if a bit thin on delivery, um, of President Obama that really put the abolition of nuclear weapons firmly on the international agenda in a mainstream way that it hadn't been for a long time. The engagement of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, the world's largest humanitarian organisation, was really important. In 2010, President Kellenberger called the diplomatic corps in Geneva and really laid this on the line as a humanitarian imperative and henceforth a major focus with, for, the, for the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement. That helped to galvanise a number of governments to insist that the outcome document, the consensus documents in the 2010 NPT, referred for the first time to deep concern about the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons. And we then saw a remarkable three international conferences. It's extraordinary that it took 73 years after nuclear weapons were first used in war before there was an international conference dedicated to considering the impacts of the weapons. But in Norway, Mexico, and Austria, in pretty rapid succession in 2013 and 14, there were evidence-based conferences that drew 80% of the world's governments, where the evidence, including what I've shown you in summary form earlier, um, was widely accepted. The recognition essentially unchallenged of these conclusions, that any use of nuclear weapons was, uh, would be an unmitigated catastrophe for which no effective response is possible, that the risks are greater than previously estimated and, and, and are probably growing, and that there is a legal anomaly that sees the last weapon of mass destruction, the only weapon that poses an existential threat, not prohibited by international treaty. The Austrian government stepped up immediately at the end of the Vienna Conference and made a commitment to work to fill that legal gap and invited other governments to join and pretty quickly got two thirds of the world's governments to say yes we're in. And resolutions related to that in the UN grew very rapidly in support between 2012 and 2015 from a dozen or so to a serious number. But of course the dilemma is that unfortunately the states that don't own the weapons can't eliminate them. So what can they do? You know, what's the, and there were an important process in, over these years in getting, building international consensus that the next best step, that most of the world that's sick of the failure of disarmament progress can do is to ban the weapon. I'm happy to say that one of the things I'm most proud of about that process was the very productive collaboration Public health is a lot about coalition building, making your business other people's business. And, um, and we were able to build a very effective coalition involving the major peak international health federations. World Medical Association, International Council of Nurses, the World Federation of Public Health Associations, singing together from the same hymn sheet with IPP and W in repeated submissions, working papers, oral testimony and commentary. Um, in the working group before the negotiations, the General Assembly and the negotiations, speaking about the planetary health imperative to get rid of these weapons with one voice. I'm really proud that some of the language of those submissions is in that treaty. So the mandate that the UN adopted at the end of 2016 by a vo vote of over three to one was pretty ambitious. New treaty, kick the can down the road towards elimination as far as you can. And by the way, you've only got, you'll all turn into pumpkins if you haven't finished by 7th of July, and you've only got four weeks of negotiations to do it. It's pretty serious marching orders. It was very ably chaired by really an angel of this process, uh, Ambassador Elaine White Gomez from Costa Rica. Um, we had remarkable, you'll recognize Ira, Helfand and Alan Roebuck, although the projection's a bit dark. We had remarkable access. This was unlike any other disarmament negotiation in many respects, but including the respect for evidence and the, and the way that we could present the evidence to the diplomats even during the negotiations. Um, really quite, quite remarkable. The other th strategy that ICANN used 
that I'm enormously proud and pleased about was the facts and data is our shop, health professionals, scientists, but they are difficult, challenging, hard to grasp, awful to think about. What can make this real is the lived human stories of the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the survivors of nuclear testing around the world, for whom nuclear weapons are not some abstract great power chess game of parity and balance, but a lived daily reality of indiscriminate suffering and loss and discrimination and ill health across generations. They were powerful. This is courageous work to do. And um, for, because of their presence, this treaty for the, is the first disarmament treaty to recognise the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on indigenous people. So when it came to the vote, um, as you know, it was spectacularly um, overwhelming for the adoption of, of the text. Um, basically all of the rest of the world except for the nine nuclear armed states and the 30 odd states that claim to rely on US nuclear weapons through NATO or separate agreements for Japan, South Korea and Australia stayed away. And in the normally very formal proceedings of the, the UN, this was a pretty emotional and historic moment. Um, Setsuko Thurlow, the Hiroshima survivor who played such a crucial role and co-accepted the Nobel Peace Prize for ICANN. All of the diplomats that I've ever heard say anything about this say this would not have happened without civil society we should all take enormous pride and encouragement from that. So nuclear weapons are on the way to becoming and the same unacceptable legal footing as those other indiscriminate weapons. The treaty... <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm, I'm um, getting a little short on time, so I'll move quickly, but I want to point out just a couple of aspects of the treaty. I would strongly commend it to you. Um, it should be on... I never travel without it. it it's a slim volume. It's not hard to read. Uh, it's, it's really worth a read. It's a very comprehensive and categorical prohibition of nuclear weapons. The evidence is very authoritatively and correctly summarised in the preamble that outlines the object and purpose. And I think increase, what's becoming increasingly important over time is that it provides the, a pathway for all states to fulfil their binding obligation to get rid of nuclear weapons. It's currently the only defined pathway for states that have nuclear weapons that don't, that have had them in the past, that have them stationed on their territory to get on with disarmament. Um, it provides a pathway which, which we should take. The Red Cross has been absolutely unequivocal in talking about how crucial prohibition is to elimination and its historic significance. One piece of evidence that I find extraordinarily compelling um, so don't listen to me that this treaty matters. Um, if I had to cite one thing that tells me this treaty matters, it's, it's this. In the US non-paper um, to its NATO allies, telling them vote no for, these, uh, for this mandate and if these negotiations happen, don't go. At the time they were saying that this would be divisive, would either be ineffective or, or dangerous, uh, wouldn't be joined by the nuclear armed states. Uh, would undermine the NPT. What did they say to their allies? They said nothing of the sort. They said this would stigmatise nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence. Yes. That this could impact parties as well as non-parties, even before it enters into force. That this could interfere with NATO's nuclear war planning, nuclear sharing. Yes. The reasons they opposed this treaty is because they recognised that it would work as intended. One of the intangible but I hope important benefits of the treaty is that even its mere existence should make professional military people who want to comply with international law less likely to consider, recommend or obey an order to use nuclear weapons. Norms are powerful. In the same 
breath as when I go to UN meetings, I hear your country's representatives in the same breath as they castigate this treaty as a threat to international security, they boast their virtual compliance with the landmines ban, which they haven't signed. Um, it, norms are powerful. And this treaty will enter into force and the norm will grow over time. We have some important allies in moral leadership here. Um, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement really out in front on this, with enormous credibility and access to governments. Some faith leaders, particularly Pope Francis, making it clear that even possession of nuclear weapons is unacceptable morally. The Red Cross being unequivocal in its call for all states to join this treaty. The World Medical Association a couple of weeks ago making a similar call that all states should join this treaty and all national medical associations should push for that and educate their publics and governments um, about the need to ban and eliminate nuclear weapons. We're seeing cities and states, including one large one not too far south of here, saying some very positive things about even though it's not formally within their jurisdiction, these are important expressions of, of will that have political and moral force. We're already seeing money starting to move, um, even before the treaty enters into force. The world's largest sovereign wealth fund, Europe's largest pension fund, some large banks, Deutsche Bank as well as some smaller ones, on the basis of the humanitarian considerations and the treaty are saying we're out of investments in companies that make nuclear weapons. This has enormous potential for divestment that is accessible to, to everybody. Um, at my university we have a research collaboration I regret to, to tell you with Lockheed Martin. I'm sure many universities in this country have research collaborations with nuclear armed companies. Universities should not be collaborating in research on weapons of mass destruction that are jeopardi that are existential threats and that are prohibited now by an international treaty. The back from the brink campaign that, that PSR has played a crucial role in that puts the abolition of nuclear weapons firmly as the goal but with some important feasible steps to reduce the danger. I was really impressed when I was in Boston at how much resonance this seems to be having with, with civil society partners and, and also galvanising the, the physicians' movement. We have had profound influence in the past. We had a major role in the ending of the Cold War, the INF and the other treaties that accompanied that. The Reagan and Gorbachev recognition of just how existential was the threat that nuclear weapons pose. Um, their saying very clearly, Gorbachev, about how this, how much of a contribution health evidence-based advocacy made, um, his specific um, comments about IPPNW, uh, really compelling reading. If you doubt ever the power about organised global health activity based on evidence, using our access and authority to influence policy, um, to the two Nobel Peace Prizes that, that um, uh, Bruce mentioned, IPPNW's and ICANN's recent one, are, are remarkably consistent. Um, both highlight the importance of evidence and communicating it publicly um, as a way of driving policy. Um, and ICANN's prize similarly. This should give enormous encouragement to all of us. Um, I'm happy to bring a medal with me. You're very welcome to enjoy it and uh, take photographs of it or with it. Um, it's yours as much as anybody's. Um, the question that we asked in a New England Journal piece recently, for me, encapsulates the existential dilemma that, that we face. Will it be the end of nuclear weapons or the end of us? It will be one of those. We all have a significant responsibility and can play a major role in making sure that the answer to that question is the right one. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tillman. For, for those of us that uh, lived through the uh, entire Cold War, um, when the greatest concern for anybody 
was that these weapons would fall into the hands of leaders that were um, irresponsible, unethical, psychotic, mentally, mentally defective. That was, our, that was our worst concern. USSR at least had some kind of balanced communication. Now we're there. Now we have nuclear weapons in the hands of some of the most uh, uh, psychologically deranged people that have ever led a country. So this is what I think makes the uh, arrival of this treaty so immensely important because, as Tillman has suggested, it gives us uh, hope for another avenue that we didn't have two years ago. So a couple of questions I'd like to frame to Tillman, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Um, what's your sense of which of the nuclear arms states might be the first to break from the pack? This could change quickly, and it really depends on, on leadership, you know, electoral outcomes, popular pressure. Um, I wouldn't underemphasize, underestimate the value of, of leadership. I think looked at currently, one would hope that North Korea might be um, the first. And I think the United Kingdom is an interesting prospect. You could imagine that a Labor government um, with, led by somebody like Jeremy Corbyn, um, in combination with uh, Scottish desire for autonomy and some increase perhaps even without complete secession, um, could revisit the decision to re renew the Trident nuclear arsenal if it were not able to be housed in Scotland, my understanding is that essentially it would have nowhere to go. It would be enormously difficult and expensive to try and find somewhere else. Most of the thinking in ICANN has been that it may be more likely to one, for one or more of the nuclear dependent states to sort of break ranks. Um, and a very important experience in relation to that uh, I think bodes quite well for that potential. And that is that membership of this treaty is entirely consistent with a military relationship with a nuclear armed state, provided activities that justify or assist preparations for possible use of nuclear weapons are excluded. The US designates 17 states as major non-NATO allies. 11 of them voted for the treaty adoption. Three have signed, Thailand, Philippines, and New Zealand, and two have ratified, Thailand and New Zealand. For none of them has there been any ructions in their ongoing military cooperation with the United States because it doesn't involve nuclear weapons activities. So it's quite possible to continue military collaboration provided nuclear weapons are excluded. So I think that the reality of that um, should help states like my own, Australia and, and Japan, um, to take some leadership and get on the right side of history sooner rather than later. So the... Um the umbrella, so-called umbrella states uh, with the U.S., both through treaty and, and others, the NATO treaty, have been creatively labeled the weasel states for kind of weaseling out under pressure from the nuclear arms states. Um, within the NATO alliance, do you have a sense of where the first break might occur? Yes, the weasels is a new technical term that entered diplomatic <laughs> parlance uh, with gusto in around... 2015, 14, 15, um, and it really refers to the states that claim to support disarmament, uh, including nuclear disarmament, but at the same time are completely conflicted by also claiming that those same weapons are central to their own security. That makes them fairly decisively more part of the problem than the solution. Um, this can change Many of us, uh, you know, quickly with electoral cycles, many of us uh, had hoped that Norway would be a major leader in NATO, a very strong history of, of humanitarian and peace uh, work around the country, around the globe, um, had been an important funder of, of, of ICANN, hosted the first of the humanitarian conferences. Um, 
but a change in government has made that look much less likely. The government of Iceland is currently a, um, a coalition that the Prime Minister certainly would like to join the treaty. Um, Sweden is currently not a, not a NATO member, but a NATO partner um, that is currently conducting a public inquiry. The Foreign Minister wants to sign the treaty. The, the NATO forces don't, so there's a bit of a, a tussle on. So this, this could depend on, on um, opportunities that arise depending on elections. The only one of the NATO members that actually participated in the negotiations um, was the Netherlands that made it clear that they wouldn't, couldn't support anything that came out of the negotiations. They have US nuclear weapons on their territory but were forced by public and parliamentary pressure to at least be there, uh, which is a, a start. Um, so it's hard to know, but we should, as a global connected campaign, swarm like bees to support and help push change where political opportunities arise. It's my understanding that civil society in the Netherlands on this is quite strong, and that that might be a breakthrough. It certainly got their government yeah. to to the negotiations, even though they they couldn't support the outcome. Um, and there is a very strong coalition in in Norway that involves peace organisations, faith-based organisations, both Protestant and Catholic, um, the Nor the Dutch Red Cross. Um, in a very powerful coalition. One of the things that we heard a good bit about was the um, extent of the U.S. pressure during the time that the treaty was being discussed um, to not participate. And uh, it's my understanding that some of that, the more went on than we know, including the president. Could you comment a bit on that? Yes, it was... It was strong pressure, um, and it wasn't all of the nuclear armed states that, that were pressuring states not to support the negotiations and then not to vote for the treaty and now not to sign it. Um, but it was particularly fierce from the US, France, UK and Russia. China was much more conciliatory. Um, at one stage even let it be known that they were considering joining the negotiations. Um, and as far as we know, haven't been putting pressure on any states not to, not to support this process. Um, much of this has not entered the public domain, um, but the South African ambassador shortly after the vote when the treaty was adopted spoke very strongly about what she called the fierce pressure that African states had come under. Um, not to, to support this treaty. Um, there was pressure right through the humanitarian conferences, through the open-ended working group, um, and through the, the General Assembly processes and the negotiations, and it hasn't stopped now. Some of it has been very well organised, very consistent. The US has sent senior representatives, Thomas Countryman, when he was um, Assistant Secretary in the Department of State, um, traveled the world visiting governments, giving diplomatic demarches about, about this nonsense. Uh, and I have to say there were reliable, to my mind at least, reports pretty consistently that at the highest level, presidential secretary of state level during the Obama era, calls were made um, during the Austrian humanitarian conference and during some of the other processes, for example, to the head of the leader of Mexico, which has been a leader of the, the ban treaty, to try and shut this down. The US had, was reported to have 12 Department of State officials at the 2016 General Assembly specifically to try and avoid a successful vote on, on the treaty negotiations. Some of this pressure has, what little is known publicly suggests that some of it was, is fairly unsavoury. Um, uh, for example, I, I, I know that uh, the country that happens to be the poorest in Southeast Asia and the most heavily landmined country on earth, Laos, um, most 
of the landmines in Laos were uh, US landmines. The US threatened cessation of funding for demining if Laos voted for the ne treaty negotiations. That's just one small example that I'm aware of, but there was clearly very fierce pressure and it had some effect. I mean, there were 12 African states who would have been expected to, to vote for the treaty who didn't. Um, and in each region, there were some states that unexpectedly stayed away or, or abstained as a result of pressure. But because the forum chosen crucially was the General Assembly, where if consensus can't be reached, a two thirds majority can make a decision, um, that pressure was not sufficient to dis derail the process. But that pressure is ongoing uh, on states not to sign not to sign the treaty. But happily, most of the states that have signed have um, reported that once they've signed, the pressure has let off. So for countries that are concerned about the pressure they're getting, the, the message is sign quickly and <laughs> get it, be done with it. I think a really distressing thing for me talking to uh, Tillman earlier in the day uh, was the information that, that leaked out that actually President Obama himself was on the phone to presidents of other countries like Mexico, urging them not to participate. I, I don't think I heard that. I don't think I knew that. Uh, and given uh, the uh, sort of respect and, and uh, recognition he's given for his declaration to move the U.S. to abolish nuclear weapons, the duplicity of that, I think, is really quite distressing. Yes, it is. Um, but it does highlight that this treaty matters that establishing an international norm is powerful. It puts the nuclear armed states on the defensive. It puts them on, on notice. They can no longer claim that, that through you know, selective interpretation of the International Court of Justice advisory opinion that, that couldn't unequivocally conclude that use of nuclear weapons under any circumstances would be contrary to international law. Um, this, these sort of loopholes have been firmly closed now uh, by, by this treaty and, and the nuclear armed states are challenged. You know, you don't get political change without discomfort and pressure and, you know, some accentuation of divisions, um, at least initially. That's crucial to progress. Uh, so that gives me great comfort that this treaty matters and it will matter even more as more states sign and ratify, as it enters into force, as states are then obliged to reflect their treaty obligations in domestic legislation, for example, making involvement in nuclear weapons activities criminal for anybody subject to their legal jurisdiction, um, promote the treaty in their diplomacy, meetings of states parties happen regularly to promote the treaty implementation. Um, each of these steps will, will increase the, the normative pressure and of course it's up to civil society to make sure that that, that pressure linked with the evidence that, that these weapons don't increase anybody's security, they only make you a target for everybody else's nuclear weapons and, and jeopardise everybody's security, um, that this will help progress elimination. So 50 states are required to sign it uh, for it to be ratified. Um, we're at what, 19 now? So it needs um, 50 states to, to ratify, yes, or accede or, or accept it. Uh, there are a variety of legal ways that states can do this. Currently 69 have signed and 19 have ratified. These things take time. There are constitutionally mandated processes in every state that, that often take considerable time and parliamentary and, and, and other processes. Um, that's faster than at one year than the ratifications that were achieved for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the NPT, the Chemical or Biological Weapons Conventions. It's l slower than the cluster munitions or landmines bans, um, but it's reasonable progress and I would be confident that this treaty would enter into force next year. Really? One more here. Um, uh, Changing the subject for a minute, you mentioned the international, the uh, uh, INF treaty. Um, if President Trump proceeds, as it looks like he is, to uh, pull out of that, wh what are what are your major concerns? What, what do you see as the domino effect from that, Tatiana? 
I think it's of profound concern to not only not be negotiating new agreements but unravelling the constraints that exist. It would really, um, you know, those who negotiated that treaty and most of the technical experts that are independent say that, that the allegations that both sides have made about breaches of, of their treaty obligations can be readily addressed through consultation. And there is actually a mechanism, a special verification commission, which has passed its sunset clause but could be easily reactivated um, to re-invoke the on-site inspections that, that were crucial to the successful and timely elimination of 2,692 intermediate range missiles before 5th of June 1991. So, I think to erode these, it's really thumbing the nose at any kind of constraints um, on nuclear weapons. It will, I think, inevitably accelerate an arms race, a new Cold War that we're essentially already in, uh, and profoundly increase the dangers of, of nuclear war, which was the reason why those missiles in Europe, SS-20s and the Cruise and Pershing missiles, that I'm sure many of you remember, aroused so much public concern around the world um, that played a major role in, in that landmark treaty. Well, let's open it up to you folks for questions. We have um, two mics here, so um, let's hear from you. Yeah, if you want to raise your hand, I can come around and hand you the mic for a question. Okay, and I see hand right here. Uh, hi, I'm David uh, Bergen. I'm just a member of the public. Um, I understand that the uh, United States is is currently trying to fund um, completely replacing the nuclear triad, including uh, submarine ballistic missiles. Um, and I've heard numbers like 500 billion per per serv per military service. Um, do you know anything about that? There are others here who know more about that than I. But yes, uh, the current plans are essentially to refurbish the whole, uh, every aspect of of, of um, the nuclear forces and the infrastructure that builds them, um, with extraordinary sums of money planned to be committed over decade-long time frames and essentially signaling, you know, if you follow the money, really no serious intent to disarm. Those are not compatible. Um, they increase the danger as well as hemorrhaging resources from so many more urgent and productive ways of increasing health and well-being. And the projection is a cost of $1.7 trillion over the next 30 years if the entire arsenal is basically replaced. Uh, that's part of the reason for immense push now to try to stop that, because you can bet that if, if these weapons are completely replaced, we're in for another 20, 30 years. Dismantling is much more difficult than preventing. It's why civil society, like our organization, is so involved right now at this crucial time when these are moving forward. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm Amy Higopian. I'm on the Nuclear Weapons Task Force with WPSR. Uh, I, like Bruce, am disturbed to hear that a previous recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize was such a terrible force in blocking the signatures on the treaty. Uh, and I wonder if you could say a little more about that and whether you think that uh, President Obama might um, find any redemption in his retirement here. I'm not the slightest surprised to hear Hillary Clinton was involved in this activity. I expected no less from her. Um, but perhaps given the dynamics now in the country, somebody might appeal to Barack Obama to play a different role in his retirement and move this treaty along. I think there's room for all voices, all 
people, all wills, anybody who wants to contribute to this, now's the time to step up. Um, it certainly would seem a, a valuable way to to offset, to create a different legacy from from you know the the enormously hopeful promise that really excited the world uh, that was so thin on delivery and the price for you know the meager agreement that we got with new start was this massive reinvestment in the refurbishment of the whole arsenal over very long time frames um, i'm not sure if such an approach has been made uh, but i think all such approaches would be welcome and appropriate to you know this this needs leadership we desperately lack global leadership I can't speak for them, but that's probably not the kind of request that they that they would uh, entertain. I know that certainly the experience of of that award has made them somewhat less likely to to offer future prizes to serving heads of state. The prize is always a balance between a mix of encouragement and recognition. That was an encouragement award almost purely. Um, I think they're leaning more towards more recognition awards. Hello. Uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate the world health approach to this topic. And my specialty, uh, I am in the private community, and my specialty is in cybersecurity. I'm a director for a multinational offensive cybersecurity organization. And so uh, my question centers around the intersection of maybe the global organizations that you deal with and their understanding and observations and opinions uh, when it comes to the cybersecurity side. Because in 2010, we saw the Stuxnet worm. That was also, of course, under the Obama administration. Um, but it was the first evidence of there being a nuclear deterrence capability on the cyber field um, coming from the Five Eyes particularly Israel, uh, took down the fifth largest nuclear reactor in Iran. So just curious if uh, those topics ever come up in your circles and if they're included in the general view of the policymakers. They certainly didn't come up in specifically in any form in the, the negotiations for the treaty and are not referred to, but I think the general development of, of cyber technology and its malevolent use on repeated occasions since since that that landmark um, intervention you know almost certainly by the US and Israel as I understand and you've you've suggested um, bodes ill for controlling nuclear risks when you have very dispersed very complex command and control and early warning systems that are that are vulnerable and acknowledged to be so by the, those who know them. So I think the confluence of, of cyber attack potential, um, particularly if combined with emerging artificial intelligence capabilities plus nuclear weapons, I mean, any intersection between those things has got to be an extraordinarily dangerous development and really accelerate the urgency of, of dealing with these weapons. Uh, before in a climate stressed world where armed conflict is likely to get more frequent and not less um, including between nuclear armed states makes eliminating the weapons and reducing the likelihood of their use in the meantime all the more crucial and urgent we time is not on our side here Um, are the religious leaders involved besides the Pope, like Buddhist and Muslim, and are we getting international religious um, input by other leaders? Yes, I'm happy to report that, that that's been an important part of ICANN's work, and there are quite a number of faith organizations of different traditions um, who've met very regularly and who have provided statements on behalf of very diverse faith groups, Hindu, Jain, Buddhist, various complexions of Buddhist, lots of stripes of Christian, um, Muslim, Jewish, uh, really impressive 
increasingly diverse. Pope Francis, I, 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 I mentioned specifically not to try and you know, be sectarian or, or selective in any way, but simply to highlight uh, that the importance of, of moral leadership and of faith communities really taking this issue on in a much more active, active way. Um, but there's still lots of room for internationally, nationally, regionally, locally to engage with uh, for faith communities to, to take a more active role in, in this work. Hi. So I was intrigued by your uh, discussion of the use of norm to um, prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And I was wondering if you could uh, discuss a little more how effective you think they'll be. Um, we've had uh, chemical, ban uh, chemical weapons ban, biological weapons bans for decades now, but there has been a recent spate in usage in Syria, potentially in the UK. So I was wondering if you see if that's going to be a really effective use, or is that kind of like something that is maybe moderately useful in the future um, in this kind of not proliferation? Sure, thanks for the question. Look, the only way of ensuring that nuclear weapons can't be used is to eliminate them. I mean, that, 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 that's clear. While they exist, there's a, there's a possibility of their use. But norms, I th we have to use the tools that are available to us. And, and, and this treaty, I think, is very important at following those lessons of history of those other treaties. I mentioned the, the US boasting its virtual compliance with a treaty that it opposed and hasn't signed as an example. And I think another one, despite the, the fact that there have been use of chemical weapons in a number of recent instances, as you mentioned, um, that in general, um, the use of chemical weapons has been stigmatized to the extent that when it was proven by the Organization on the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in 2013 that chemical weapons had been used in Syria, not a party to the Chemical Weapons Convention. The US and Russia at a very testy time in their relationship with disagreements about Crimea and about uh, Syria agreed within v virtually 24 hours that Syria needed to be forced to join the Chemical Weapons Convention and despite the chaos of the war, Syria was successfully disarmed of 1,260 tons of chemical weapons which were removed and destroyed um, under Norwegian jurisdiction. That obviously hasn't solved the problem because the precursor materials, particularly when you're using mainly chlorine uh, bombs, are, are fairly widely available and can be imported again. Um, so that hasn't decisively dealt with the problem, but it has made it far smaller than it c could have been if, if those stockpiles remained. So I think in that instance as well, the power of the norm was invoked. Um, the treaty wasn't specifically mentioned actually by President Obama at the time. It was the norm um, against chemical weapons use because Syria wasn't a party to the convention. So I think these norms are very influential. The US doesn't produce cluster munitions anymore. Landmines are only deployed in the demilitarized zone in Korea where the Koreans are busy removing them now happily. This is, these are important influences. Most financial institutions that have any socially responsible investment policies include chemical weapons, landmines and cluster munitions amongst their prohibited prescribed investments because they're prohibited by international treaty. So these norms is not the definitive solution, but it's a really important step uh, to progress elimination and try and reduce the likelihood of the weapons being used in the meantime. And we should use all of the means at our disposals to, to strengthen that norm. Hello, thank you for all the facts that you have given us um, in the economic side of things. Um, this may be a, a rather practical um, way of looking at things. Um, you said that uh, Deutsche Bank and the Belgian banks has been, they have been um, divesting from um, any countries that um, uh, have, still have nuclear weapons. Um, maybe... Uh, companies, com companies oh, sorry, rather than companies. countries. Yeah. Yes. Um, so maybe, uh, in a sense, if we 
um, appeal to companies that they can reuse the plutonium, um, then maybe they will have a bigger um, motivation to um, disarm, for that country to disarm. So, for example, um, U.S. Has been, has been buying um, plutonium from Russia uh, for our nuclear uh, plants. Um, I'm not sure if this audience or you, yourself uh, is uh, in any way for uh, nuclear plants uh, using uh, nuclear power uh, for electricity, but, but that is a practical way of looking at things, um, and maybe that will sway the... the um, economic side of things, one way or another. Yeah, that, that agreement uh, between Russia and, and uh, the US was for highly enriched uranium to be down blended to reactor grade uranium, which produced about half the nuclear energy, half the nuclear electricity generated in the, in the United States over a decade long period, roughly. That agreement has not been renewed, so it's now discontinued. I th we can argue about about the merits of doing that. It's certainly preferable to have um, the products of highly enriched uranium in radioactive waste, which has to be managed than in weapons. Um, but I think from a public health point of view, I'd certainly want to argue that it's best in neither. Um, so I think the there's not really major cost drivers here. There's no commercial value or use in plutonium as Japan is is finally discovering um, after reprocessing and having 47 tons of separated plutonium that you know is now embarrassing for them they really have no have clearly no possible plausible use for that um, the international panel on fissile materials um, I think is really the best independent authoritative expert group on, on these issues and they clearly advocate cessation of reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel to extract plutonium um, and an end to the production of highly enriched uranium. Its use in the production of medical isotopes, its uses in, in marine propulsion uh, all have all safer alternatives. Um, I think we just have time for one more question, and I saw this hand here, but we will have some time after as well for questions. Okay, well, I'd like to um, hand it back over to the person that handed me the microphone, and I'll tell you why. Um, it's been kind of obvious to me to go to these uh, kinds of events and see uh, the uh, relative ages of the people that are involved. Uh, I work in a public school, and as I approach retirement, I uh, I look at the kids that I, I have at, at my uh, elementary school, and I go like, wow, these are the ones that are going to suffer from uh, the climate change that's uh, that's now inevitable, and uh, getting going to get worse. Um, my eyes were really open tonight when I saw uh, the doctor talk about the immediate effects of climate change that would happen with any use of, uh, even moderate use of, uh, I hesitate to use that word moderate, but low amount of use of nuclear weapons. Um, and I think that we're uh, right here, uh, as it says right here, 20 miles away from uh, the Triton nuclear base, and there's been a lot of, uh, uh, that's been pointed out numerous times. But I don't see that uh, Seattle is one of the uh, cities that's listed uh, as uh, taking a position uh, of being nuclear free. And I, I know that we have uh, a, an organization here with the Washington uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility that's, uh, that's uh, working uh, strongly to, to create a coalition. And I'd like to highlight that by passing the microphone back to Lily and she could tell a little bit about uh, what her uh, organization is uh, is doing and how we could uh, help to participate in uh, maybe uh, doing something locally to uh, make a big effect around here. Lily Adams. <laughs> I, I will actually be speaking about our coalition in just a couple minutes, um, so we'll get to it. <laughs> um, we have about two more minutes, so if one other person has a brief question for, oh, Bruce himself. Yeah, I'd like to pose the last one because <laughs> one ahead. of the really profound uh, uh, 
aspects of passing the UN Treaty was that the humanitarian arguments carried the day in ways that traditional arms control ar arguments had not. And that was the health professionals really on the front line. Can you talk about what you'd like health professionals to do moving forward before we close? I think there's lots and lots that health professionals can and should do. They should educate themselves. They should educate their patients and students, both pre-service and in-service, they should encourage their professional organisations to raise these issues, um, use their access to officials to support wider initiatives to, um, to really promote nuclear weapons elimination. Um, ICANN is a campaign coalition which is open uh, to any organisation that agrees with its goals. Uh, please, please use it in any way that's, that's helpful to you. Um, I think I've, I've really tried to, to highlight and, and encourage you that, that evidence-based advocacy really makes a difference. It's been the crucial underpinning for the ICANN campaign was that humanitarian evidence. Um, combined with the voices of survivors and and I would strongly urge you to to work with survivors um, in educating the public including young people who really need to hear about this um, and need to engage with this issue one of the challenges for ICANN was was lots of people said you're never going to make this a global concern. You're never going to interest young people. You know, they've moved on. They don't know about nuclear weapons. They're worried about climate change. Well, if they're worried about climate change, they should be first and foremost worried about nuclear weapons. Um, there's a lot of education to do. I think ICANN has shown that young people can be effective and, and can be engaged. The most effective way that ICANN worked was by having several hundred campaigners present at every one of the crucial meetings working very effectively in a very professional, coordinated way, uh, repeatedly every time meetings happen with the diplomats from their, their governments doing whatever it was that they, that they needed to hear. Um, young people have a really important stake in this and we need to help them uh, get involved. But, but health professionals have enormous access and authority and can access decision makers your Congress, your representatives need to hear from you. Um, your unions and professional organisations need to hear from you to get active on this. PSR obviously does, does very important work. We are unfortunately out of time. Um, please, please join me in giving a big hand to Tillman. Um, I, I'd just like to say that, um, first of all, I'd like to give a, a, a thank you to Lily and to Laura and to Marcel, who did a huge amount of work in helping to organize this evening, so please give them a hand as well. <laughs> and, and finally, um, uh, Lily and Laura will be wrapping this up, uh, Lily talking first of all about the work that we're doing uh, here in the Northwest uh, through the coalition, WPSR. Um, Tillman and I are going to take our leave. Uh, he is on a really um, amazing tour of the West Coast cities uh, for this series of lectures. He's catching a plane tonight and he and I will go to the airport when you folks wrap this up. So thanks very much for coming.